So, Bob, I thought we would just review Google News stories that are about psychology and just, you know, maybe have a informative, comedic back and forth banter between two therapists, two clinicians that might be entertaining to the listeners as such as so that they can forget about their terrible lives for, for just one hour. What do you say, Bob? Who are you going to get? <laughs> This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Doc. That's some of that banter I was talking about. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Hahn. I'm a therapist and a professor. Uh, I'm your friend, Bob, from graduate school way back when. Bob Gettle. Yeah. BobGettle.com. Uh, so, the first... Uh, so, I just... So I just Google News, psychology. The first thing that comes up is something on Psychology Today that is titled Five Self-Sabotaging Things Unconfident People Do. Oh, I think I saw that this week. I don't read those, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to read them. Okay. Number one, unconfident people keep their, goal, their good ideas to themselves. Unconfident people keep their good ideas to themselves. What do you think about that, Bob? Yeah, it's probably true. I mean, they're not confident in their good ideas. They don't even know if it is a good idea, I mean, presumably. Yeah. I find that one to be kind of weird, though, because it's like of all the things you could, you know, the five things you could come up with that that uh, unconfident people do, keeping your good ideas to yourself seems like I would put that lower on the list than top five. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Um, Maybe no, it should say they keep all their thoughts to themselves. I mean, right. You know, right. the bad ideas, where do they go? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they keep their feelings to themselves. They yeah. keep, you know, good ideas about what, like... Um, you know, how to take out the garbage in a more efficient way or something. Yeah. Anyway, number two, unconfident people overthink rather than directly asking for what they want. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's probably true too, but is that true? Just, I mean, who's these unconfident people? <laughs> yeah. who, 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 is it, who doesn't do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Number three, unconfident people defer decisions to other people, even when they have more investment in the outcomes of these decisions than whoever they're deferring to. Is that, is that an unconfident person thing to do? Uh, that could be gender bias. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Like an unconfident man, uh, d is, does he do that? I don't know. Yeah. But like women are trained to do that. Yeah. I think what they're talking about is like unassertive people. I, I think what they're saying, right? Or, or oh, qu like quiet. Passive people. Passive people, right? Because you could be terribly unconfident and be very boisterous and overbearing. You know what I mean? I've met many passive people who are confident, though. They tend to be introverts. True. Four, unconfident people ruminate about how to absolutely ensure other people will have a good reaction to their behavior. What do you... uh, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one I can kind of... I, I, can, I don't disagree. No, but I think the message is like... But I think what... Again, I think what they're talking about is shyness, honestly, or... Or, I don't know. That sounds a little perfectionistic. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like anxious or something. Yeah. Um, unconf number five, unconfident people let mistakes from their past hold them back from taking important actions today. Now, that one, that one seems a little silly to be attributed just to unconfident people. That's the top five? Yeah. Well, you know, psychology today. Mm. I mean, so the point is, is there's a lot of really interesting articles <laughs> that come up on, on uh Google uh, News. Okay, here's, a, here's another one on uh, The Verge. A social psychologist explains why we should ask for help more often. We wildly underestimate how likely people are to help. What do you think about that, Bob? Oh, well, I'm thinking of that Kitty Genovese thing, you know, the group psychology. What was that called? Do you remember that? Uh yeah, what is it's that It's a social phenomenon? thing, social yeah. psych thing. Uh, uh, the in oh, it, bystander, uh, bystander effect. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which has been debunked. Have you, have you, did you know about the full story of the Kitty Genovese story? I don't think I do. Well, I'll try to summarize my probably incorrect uh, understanding of it, but the original story was published or, you know, in the news that Kitty Genovese was being attacked by a man repeatedly. He would leave. He came back. He like, he left like a couple times. Yeah. And she was screaming, and it was nighttime, and uh, reportedly dozens of people could hear her suffering outside of their um, apartment window, and did apparently did nothing. And the um, the the narrative, and then she died. And then the narrative was right afterwards. It was 
this was this was I think in the seventies, and it was a time when um, crime in the United States was at its all time high. There were um, a lot of there was a lot of just really terrible things happening in our country um, that were leading to a lot of crime. And the um, the story was New York and our country are going down the tubes and people have no morals today and that um, people are awful and the criminals are just, you know, running wild, doing whatever they want. And what a terrible, what a terrible thing those people did that they didn't reach out to help. Then the second story came out, which was, social psychologists got a hold of it and actually started studying this and actually said, no, it's not, it's not an immoral, it's not a matter of morality or a matter of caring or empathy. It was a matter of um, when we see, when we're in a group of people and we see someone suffering, we think we're, we, we're not per, we don't feel personally responsible because uh, we figure someone else will do something. And two, we don't want to be embarrassed by doing the wrong thing. You know, we don't want to step forward and say, Hey, stop. And then have us be the target of the group. Cause none of us like to stick out. Very few of us like to stick out in a group. And so that was the conclusion was, you know, that's what happened. Well, that has been since debunked several times, uh, left and right by actual journalists going to the neighbors and to the police reports, uh, and, um, actually telling the real story, which was that a number of people called the police. A number of people actually tried to help. I mean, one person in her building actually ran to Kitty's side and was there with her as she was dying and holding her hand, do you know? And so this, so the whole thing, uh, the, the original narrative that no one cares is completely wrong. And the, even the social psychologist uh, report that, this was evidence of a, of a bystander effect also uh, didn't actually happen. Do you know what I mean? I might have some of this wrong, but... No, no, I'm listening. I'm just amazed that someone could come up with an explanation for something that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the uh, reason why... So the, the, the reason for the original narrative was that... Um, was who do you think... I, I don't know if I have this detail right, but I, I, from my memory, this is, why do you think the original narrative was told the way that it was and by who? Who, who st stood to gain by the narrative that, um, you know, that, that original story that no one did anything? What, who, sta who stands to gain from that? The social psychologist who needs funding for his grant. Well, that, but prior to that, so the very first, the very first press release, so to speak. I... I I don't know. The police. The police. The police were called and didn't, and didn't come. come. Of course. <laughs> of course. It's this, glaring. Yeah. This woman died uh, and the police were called. So who gains to benefit yeah. by claiming that no one called the police? Yeah, the cops. Especially because it's like, imagine if from the very beginning, there was like a number of people called the police and this woman was suffering. People, the citizens were doing their part. And this woman was suffering and screaming for a long period of time. And the police never came. Like, so guess who told the story? <laughs> That's <laughs> and, amazing. And guess who had the information? Because they were the ones who had gone around and gathered stories. And, you know, it's not like the journalists necessarily had the time to do that. And so... Well, you um, trust the cops, right? <laughs> yeah, you trust the cops, right? Um, anyway, so, wow. uh, so, so, so this is on the verge. Social psychology explains why we should ask for help more often. We widely underestimate how likely we, we are to, to, to get help. Hmm. Yeah. I think that, um, I think that's a product of our society because of how, um, especially in, a, in the United States, because we, our culture is based on, Northwestern European culture, which was very quote unquote independent and, um, uh, you know, self, uh, what sufficient, you sufficient. Right. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of our ancestors were the sorts of people who would go off West and be on a homestead and have to depend on yourself. And so, so those who, reached out or sort of thought of themselves as needing to depend on a 
on handouts or, or, well, that's a bad way of putting it, but support from extended family would have perished because if you're on a homestead in the middle of Kansas and your nearest neighbor is like 50 miles and, and you don't even have a donkey to ride to the nearest, uh, you've got to figure shit out on your own. You got to yeah. grow your own food. You got to uh, solve your own problems. And so, um, so that's what our culture is based on. And most cultures around the world are not like that. You know, most cultures are more rational, which is, um, share and ask like, um, I, it always boggles me that, um, on any given block or in, in better yet in a condo building or an apartment building, you'll have 20 apartments that are within just, you know, 30 steps of each other. <laughs> um, and yet every single, uh, unit apartment has a vacuum cleaner. When you use a vacuum cleaner, oh. Right. Once every two weeks, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe once, maybe, maybe even once a day. Right. But um, at the very least, uh, you only need half of those vacuum cleaners. If you just knocked on the door and said, hey, can I, bar- can I use our vacuum cleaner? You know, when I suggest that to people, they're like, that's, a, that's insane. I don't want to interact with my neighbors. It's like, well, think about how much money we could save and think about how much resources we could be sharing. Um, you know, back in the old days, you'd, you'd go to the neighbors and ask for a cup of sugar or, yeah. you know, you ran out of milk because, you know, but today it's like that, that notion is, is absurd. I would never, I would never, um, I, I wouldn't want my neighbors to come by and ask for the vacuum cleaner. That's creepy. There's all this like creepy culture. Yeah. Like, oh, it's creepy. Like it's weird if you're not doing it on your own, that's gotta be suspect. Yeah. Right. Huh, like what are you, what's your angle here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh or what kind of deadbeat are you that you can't afford right. your own vacuum cleaner suddenly change is missing from the top of the dresser and my daughter's knocked up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so this is uh an element of our culture and yeah we don't ask for help uh and we uh, maybe falsely think that no one will help when often people do another element of this that i find a lot is that um, you know, clients or even just people in my life will be suffering and, um, you know, I'll be uh, listening to them and providing support for them or something. And they'll inevitably say something to the effect of, I'm sure you, you don't want me talking about this anymore. Or they'll say something like, um, uh, sorry to bother you with my problems or something. And I'm, and I've said that too. And every single time someone has said that to me, I'm like, huh? Like, that I'm not even in that zone. Yeah. Like You're I'm surprised. I'm fine. Like, and I, what I've, what I've started to say now to people is um, your problems don't bother me. Like I don't have your problems. You understand? Like you're the one suffering. Mm-hmm. I'm just listening to you talk about it. You know, I'm just, I'm just hanging out with you as you talk about your, your difficult times. Um, when, when, when we separate and you go home and I go home, I don't think about it anymore. <laughs> like, it does, like, I'm sorry to be uh, callous about it, but your problems don't affect me. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I'm sad for you and yeah. I, hope, I hope the best for you. Yeah. But, you know, I got my own problems to worry about. Yeah. I, I don't worry about your problems, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're not taking on their broken vacuum cleaner. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah, independent, pull yourself up. But no, but the point is, is that we have this notion that, um, that, it's burdensome to other people. Yeah. You know, people will say that about me as a therapist. They'll be like, oh man, you know, I know my job is hard, but man, your job must be so hard. And I'm just like, maybe in the beginning I took it home with me, but I don't do that anymore. Yeah. It's like once the session is over, you know, it's over. And you can't survive I, if right. you don't. I care. Yeah. But what good is it going to do me to sit there and ruminate, you know, on, on someone else's situation like that? You know? Actually probably do some harm. Right. And um, life is suffering and life sucks. And so the idea of um, sort of ruminating uh, has the assumption that there's something you can do, you know, or there's a problem afoot. If you're suffering, you're in life. There's life is happening. At you. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, like you're alive, you know, and yeah, it sucks. That's it's, how you can tell. <laughs> there's, there's, it's not a silver. I'm not saying there's a silver lining. I'm just saying. <laughs> You know, you just have to accept that life is suffering, you know. I mean, I heard this stat, something like a third or a half of Americans are experiencing chronic pain or or some kind of pain in that moment. You know what I mean? Oh, really? Yeah. Like Jeez. a lot of people are suffering from ongoing pain. And 
you know, because no one walks around with this big sign over their head oh, saying, right. you know, I have pain, so you don't know. That's true. And, and people feel ashamed to talk about it because they don't want to seem like a wuss or they don't want to seem um, like they're complaining too yeah, much or something. Whiny. Yeah, um, Or they feel deficient somehow themselves because it might have been something they did. Like right. they, they tweaked their back as they were, you know, picking up a box wrong or right. something like that. So it's like it's their fault, you know. Right. And it's... Um, uh, uh, it's it's really unfortunate that people don't reach out for help. You know, do you do you ever have people say that to you? It's like, oh, you're a therapist. That must be really hard to like be burdened with. How do you how do you handle the burden of other people's problems? Yeah, occasionally people ask me that, and I, my response is pretty much the same. Yeah, you know, I I don't. Take were it on. you when you were younger as a therapist? Can Was I say what burdened? Was it harder? Oh yeah, when I started out, yeah, that's a that's a skill a person has to develop, or, or they're not going to make it. Does that translate into your uh, personal life of not necessarily being burdened by your friends' problems and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I don't even give a shit about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be my problems, or it's, no? It's supposed to no. Wait. Okay, another. Um, see, that's some of that no, funny I, banter, you know, that's yeah, right. helping people to forget their shitty lives. But in all honesty, I don't think my. I mean, I care about my friends' problems, but I don't think I take them on. Right. You can't. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it, even if I wanted to, it's, what do I, what am I supposed to do? You know, yeah, right. it's like, okay, you're grieving the loss of your relationship. Some, you know, someone dumped you. Yeah. Uh, what am I going to do about that? You know? Besides be a presence. Right. That's plenty though. Right. I'm not, I'm not, there's nothing, there's no hill to climb for me. You know, it's just yeah. like, I'm here with you. This sucks. You know? Um, hey, you know, that's kind of, that's another thing about our culture is we're really problem solving. Right. And we're not really good at sitting with and accepting and, li and living with it. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people feel like just listening, oh, that can't ever be enough. But then they never do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I have this huge, any of my supervisees knows, um, weird relationship with the, word, with the phrase just listening. Oh, yeah. Because a lot of new therapists will say something, at some point they'll say something to the effect of, well, I don't know. I'm just listening. And so I'll go, I'll go, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like listening is one of the most curative outcomes based, scientifically proven, well-researched, well-established uh, therapeutic techniques and approaches in our field. So, you know, it'd be like saying, um, well, I don't know. I just gave penicillin to that person, you know, you know, what, to when they had an infection, you know, it's like, you didn't just give them penicillin, like, although that's fairly easy to do for, for that physician, you know, you didn't have to do surgery or anything yeah. like that. But penicillin does cure things and, yeah. and heal and listening does too. And, and, um, uh, and, but I find myself using the phrase in another sense of like, stop and just listen is kind of, kind of like, it can mean both a negative thing about listening right. and a positive thing. Right, you know, like right. Maybe you should just be listening is, yeah. is sort of the message. So, so that's my little thing on that. Um, all right. Here's another uh, article on cleveland.com, which is National Museum of Psychology to reopen at University of Akron June 27th of this year, I believe. Really? A National Museum of Psychology. That's in the same town as the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Akron? No, Cleveland. Oh. Is it in Cleveland? Well, it's the University of Akron. Oh, wow. Shit, I don't know Ohio, so. Yeah. Um, so the National Psychology... Sorry, I'm museum off. Museum. I'm, I'm already psychology. off topic. <laughs> <laughs> National Museum of Psychology. But that's great, right? That's yeah. Cool. I, what, I mean, what, so it's the only of its kind. The what, only of its kind, it says in the United States. What, what do you think's in it? Well, I'm looking at some pictures here, and um, they have the, what looks, I don't know if it's the, uh, I don't know if they call it a Bobo doll. It's like a like a clown that is a blow-up doll that you punch. Bandura. Bandura, right. Oh, really? They have the Bop doll. Yeah, Bop doll, right? Yeah. And they, it looks like they have a straight jacket from the 1700s. Wow. Looks like they have some other instruments of, you know, ancient psychological testing on people <laughs> um there's someone in a uniform or something oh i think they have one of the zimbardo uh, outfits in a on a mannequin you know from the stanford prison experiment 
Oh, what they, I don't remember what they did. Uh, actually, I mean, so there's another article that is about that. So we can talk about that for a second. I wonder um, if they have a real live Oedipus complex. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like uh, actors come out and there's like a boy. It's like, um, you know. Uh, I'm yeah. anal retenting. <laughs> <laughs> it, an animatronic uh, a group of people, right? Just <laughs> all the different defense mechanisms. I love it. Um, I'm in the phallic phase. Um, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. So here's a article on ink. I didn't even know that was a thing. Ink. Ink like like ink, like pen ink like, like uh, incorporated. Oh yeah. Uh, and the article is called "Famous Psychology Experiments." Experiment is a fraud, a sham, and a lie. You were almost certainly taught this 50-year-old experiment's findings, but what really happened? So Zimbardo was a psychologist, or is, at Stanford. And in the 70s, early 70s, I, I believe, think, yeah, he uh, ran a uh, experiment in which... I did a whole episode on this, actually. You can find it on, in our archives. But um, from my memory, what he did was he gathered something like 20 or 15 students in the summertime. And uh, it just put an ad in the paper said, I'll, you know, you'll get paid um, this amount of money per day to be involved in this experiment. And the people showed up and he, uh, it's, this is all considered unethical, by the way, uh, but uh, it was, I guess, considered fine at the time. And he uh, just by random chance assigned people to be either prisoners or guards and then uh, put them in this, uh, the basement of the psychology department and sort of walled it off and just let the experiment go on. And so all Zimbardo did was tell the guards, look, you have to keep control of, of the prisoners. And so and what ended up happening from, and they had closer cameras and what seemingly happened was the guards became increasingly cruel uh, in a way that um, the conclusion was like, you put anyone in a position where they're a guard and they're, um, it sort of put social pressure on them somehow to become cruel and inhumane and terrible. And so it was this idea that like anyone can be a Nazi, uh, you know, yeah. de death camp, horrible person, you right. know, like if, if you put them in the right circumstance, like it, it will happen to anybody. And so, by implication, we need to just we need to put a lot of controls on these kinds of situations. Otherwise, like cruelty will just occur. And also, the other th the other thing that they found was that the prisoners started losing their mind, and some some people actually started uh, becoming quite unglued and uh, from the emotional psychological torture, essentially. Jeez. Um, and there's a movie about it. Yeah. Uh, with Billy Crudup playing the part of Zimbardo and documentaries and where they interview the people later on. But Crudup anyway, is an unfortunate name. Crudup, yeah. Yeah. He was so big back in the day. I love him. He's a great actor. Yeah. Stage Beauty, that's a great film. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was in Watchmen. Oh, yeah, that's as right. Dr. Manhattan. Dr. Manhattan. He was in um, Big Fish, I think. Oh, that's right. He was the son in Big Fish. Yeah. He was in Almost Famous. Like yeah, that's right. He was the star, the one star. of the stars. Mm -hmm. Like there was a time when he was just like every he was playing. He was in every yeah. movie, you know. And then, and then it's like, what happened to him? He was in that movie where the 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 prison the the kids are put in. They're like in juvie, and the guards are sexually violating them. Brad Pitt and um, that oh, other yeah. guy, Jason Patrick. Right. You remember that? Sleepers. Sleepers. Yeah. 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 Walk like a man. Yeah. Talk like right. is it um Robert De Niro in Yeah, that De Niro's movie? in it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that movie having a really big effect on me back in the day because it um in a in a popular movie with big stars, they talked about how boys could also be sexually abused as children and the deep psychological effect it would have on them and um and all the different kinds of, but also like how you can heal from it over time or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which at the time, you know, nowadays, like, of course, right? Right. Like, it's like, yeah, of course that happens. But at the time, 
Yeah. Yeah. I totally, don't... totally foreign idea. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, you know, in the nineties they would, there was, you know, a, a frequent refrain from people was, um, uh, well, there are two ideas that they were talking about a lot and still are, is that, um, they'll say something like, you know, half of all girls are sexually assaulted by a certain age or something like that, uh, to really let people know, like, this isn't, this isn't a rare thing. This right. is like very common. And, uh, it's just a slightly less prevalence for boys. Yeah. So, you know, like the, the, the rate at which boys are sexually assaulted by a certain age is just slightly less than for girls. Like, in a, at a, you know, because most people don't even recognize it, you know, and we still have that problem, you know. Yeah. Uh, boy, everyone feels like they can't come forward, but particularly boys, mm. you know. And there's jokes about it too. It's just like, oh, um, I would want to be raped by her, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's right. Like, all right, let's take a break, and when we get back, let's continue talking about this. What do you say, Bob? Sure. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. Please become a patron of the podcast. If you don't, I'm going to put you in a Zimbardo-like prison and like uh, have Bob be the prisoner or the guard, and he will um, really make your life miserable. So go to your computer now. Uh, go to patreon.com and become a patron. And to those of you who already are a patron, you get to be the guards. So this, this article on Inc. Um, says, let's see... Da, da, da. Basically, um, the summary of when I was looking over this is that, okay, a prisoner who famously had a breakdown after hours, in fact, was just fine, but acting, as he admitted in an interview uh, last summer. Uh, this doesn't surprise me, because like when you watch the documentary and when you watch the footage, I, it's like a lot of it seems a little contrived. The other thing is, is that um, Zimbardo claimed that he didn't really do anything to the he didn't give him any instructions they just this social experiment happened outside of his control but from what i understand after the guards and their shift he zimbardo would sit down with them and say you have to like you got to like get control you know and so these people are you know these people are these young men are students being paid f to do something and they're just like okay so if i want to get paid today i have to I, I'm getting the feeling like yeah. this, like my boss, Zimbardo, wants me to be harder on the prisoners. Okay, right. I, I guess I'll be harder. Yeah. And then they'd go in, be harder, and then Zimbardo wouldn't chastise them because Zimbardo's like, oh my God, this is this is gold. You know, yeah. like, like, oh, look, it's happening. Right. This is going to be, because if nothing happened, right. he wouldn't have anything to write about. Sure. And, and lo and behold, you know, many decades later, we're still talking about him. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> um, now, I've seen him talk about this whole thing later on and he, you know, he, he doesn't, um, from my memory, he's not like delusional about the ethics and what it really meant, you know, that he found. Cause he, 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 he doesn't just rely on this. He's been studying things along these lines, like afterwards, like the way that prisoners were treated during the Iraq war when those soldiers were, humiliating the prisoners by stripping them naked and making them do homosexual acts with each other, yeah. putting uh, bags over their heads, um, mm. uh, taking pictures with them as they're being tortured and humiliated. Like he, he brings in a lot of actual data and, and points to like, look, you know, okay, fine. The Stanford Stanford prison experiment had some problems, but let's, let's look at some real life data too. Yeah. And, and what conclusions we can draw from that, you know? And what he, what he was saying was that, uh, I think what Zimbardo was saying, if I remember right, I might get this wrong, was that um, you have to have a culture that explicitly talks about the rules of these sorts of things. If you if you don't have that, then the prisoners or the guard or sorry the guards will slowly start to gravitate towards a very demeaning way of treating the the prisoners and. It's and it's shown time and time again, you know, like in um, Nazi Germany with with Jewish people. Yeah, it's it. it there's just this tendency, and I, I th maybe he was saying, I could be completely making this up, <laughs> but I think he might have been saying it's a way for us to cope with it because we're treating other human beings badly by making them be prisoners, and then in our minds we have to defend against that by basically thinking of them as not really human beings. Yeah. 
And then that leads to the ability to be cruel to them because you're just like, well, they're not real human. They're not real. They're not even really alive. Yeah. You know? um, anyway, so this, so this article talks about how, um, so another th- bullet point, guards who supposedly began acting sadistically of their own accord had in fact been coached and told to be mean. Huh. Um, so, you know, there's that. That's a way to mine the data. Right. Um, and watching the documentary when you actually, um, they interview one of the most sadistic guards uh, later in life. And it's really interesting to hear him talk about it because he's, um, he, you know, it's, I don't know, it's an interesting documentary. Anyway, uh, another article here on uh, Google News. We have the Daily Journal from Kankakee, Kankakee, Illinois. Can Kaki. So it's K A N. Yeah. Can K A Ka Ki K E E Can Kaki, Illinois. Kakanki? Kakanki? Probably Kakanki. Kakanki? Man. I mean, I thought Issaquah was bad or Snoqualmish, you know, but Kankaki. It has like three letters in it, just repeated. Yeah, there's like, yeah, right. It's just like. There's a lot of K's and A's and and E's in there. Uh, This is a fascinating article. I'll read the whole thing. Uh, Nicholson earns psychology degree. That's the tagline. Nicholson earns psychology degree. And here's the article. Daniel Nicholson of St. Anne graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology from Clover Stockton College in Canton, Missouri. End of article. That's the entire, this is an article that was on Google news. Huh? Like, you know, like top 10 Google news about psych must be a very slow psychology day when, um, one of the top hits for psychology is this random person, Danielle Nicholson (laughs) earned a bachelor's degree in psychology (laughs) from an unknown (laughs) college in Canton, Missouri. Like, wow. And that's the entire article. How does this, how does this happen? And then tagged are all these random people uh, like on this Kayla Payton Dean's list. um, uh, The word student, Donald. Why is Donald uh, tagged? Anyway. That's a hell of a news story. Why would, why would they have a, why would there be that? Maybe the town has like three people in it. Yeah. One of them's out of town. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I wanted to, I don't know why that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, maybe I, is there, if there's a listener out there who could tell us, yeah, maybe you live there or something. I mean, uh, yeah, it just boggles the mind. I mean, you, maybe the, maybe someone who works on the staff for that journal just decided yeah. that it'd be fun to, yeah. I don't know. It's so bizarre. Like how many people are getting bachelor's degrees at any given time. Right. And you're just going to have one article for one person and there's no detail. It's like this person got a degree from this college and that's it. Anyway. His 15 minutes of fame have been fucked over. (laughs) Another Psychology Today article, this is actually pretty sad, separating kids from families as a a psychological disaster, how familial separation can lead to adverse long-term consequences. This is obviously a recent article. Have you heard about this whole story? Oh, yeah. It's terrible. What do you think about it? It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Is it wrong? I believe it is wrong. Yeah. Is it immoral? Yeah, I believe it is immoral. Yeah. And is it um, in line with some of the other things that Trump does or says? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. I talked about this in full in another episode, but this this uh, article just lays out the... Um, the known effects that separating children from their parents has on those kids. They have more social problems, more problems with school, uh, more attention problems. They're withdrawn. They have trouble with their emotions. They have lower empathy. They have more aggression and their other research. I saw they're more prone to criminal behavior. (laughs) Um, So it's like, oh, man, uh, that's terrible. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah. But from what I understand, they're stopping it. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Trump dehumanizes them, the immigrants. Oh, talking about Zimbardo and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And it makes it easy to be cruel. 
Right. Mm. Yeah. Another Psychology Today article, three high-risk relationship complaints you shouldn't ignore. Oh, okay. So high-risk relationship complaints that you shouldn't ignore. Should we try to guess what they are? Yeah, go for it. I want to break up with you. (laughs) (laughs) I I think you're a terrible human being. (laughs) Did you fart in bed again? (laughs) (laughs) Um. So, number one is frustrations about sex. Mm. They say, when your partner voices sexual frustrations or concerns, take them seriously. Discuss them honestly. Work on finding mutually satisfying resolutions. Follow up. Deliver on promises. And if you're stuck, get educated. There's lots to do about this issue. Uh, What do you think about that, Bob? That's generally good advice. Maybe take your partner seriously when they're upset about something. That's, That's a good thing to do. Yeah, in general. Yeah. Yeah. If it's sex or otherwise. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, Number two, clashes with in-laws. As difficult as as it is to set limits with parents who might feel offended or betrayed by such such actions, if the boundaries are reasonable and clear, most in-laws learn to respect them in time. Um, What do you think about that What do you think about that? I find that discussions about this are frequently, um, as, you know, we were talking about earlier, Northwest European oriented, which Uh is like stay out. In-laws need to know their place. Nuclear family. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly if that's, if that's how you want to live and you know, it's cool, but that's not that we shouldn't assume that's the best healthy model. It certainly is what society assumes to be the best healthy model. In-laws need to know their place. And it's funny because like, well, in-laws, they're still family, direct family members of another person in the family, <laughs> do you know? Yeah. So now, having said that, I'll say that as a family therapist, I've had many conversations with people about boundaries and about what people want. But the idea that w- one person's notion of what sort of boundaries should be like, uh, that they get to win, so to speak, mm. um, is wrongheaded. Also... In my experience, it's not a, it's not a matter. People always talk about boundaries. You got to draw a boundary. You know, you got to draw a firm boundary. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, how about you just have a fucking conversation with them and help them understand like where you're coming from, and so they'll they'll know your heart and your mind, and because they're human beings and they care, they'll they'll figure out a solution. You know, like uh, because drawing boundaries can often cause more problems because if you do it in a certain way, yeah. like. There are some grandparents who, given their culture and their family, the way their family is, they want to see their grandkids and maybe even you um, frequently. And maybe you come from a family where that didn't happen and you just you just don't like that. You like your privacy. That's okay too. But to be like, um, which I've seen, p- people will tell their in-laws, they'll be, right. or that what they'll do actually is they'll tell their spouse to tell the in-laws. Um, they can only come over once a month. Right. I'm drawing the line. Right. Well, when you do that to them, they're getting this message of like, one, you don't like them. Mm-hmm. That that hurts them. And two, that um, they can't have access to people in their family. That's a very tough pill to swallow for some people, mm-hmm. particularly if, again, they're used to much more contact. And there's nothing pathological about it. In fact, it's probably more healthy, oh, obviously, yeah. in a lot of ways. And so... Um, uh, now, some of your in-laws might be annoying. You know, they might come over and criticize you or whatever. But how about just speak up for yourself? You know, we've read other articles about don't be unconfident. Speak up for yourself. Just say, I don't like it when you, you know, talk shit to me. Yeah. The other thing is is that I see a lot of families do is the spouses will get in big fights about it. Yeah. Because, you know, the upset spouse will go to the the child of those parents and say, like, you got to keep your parents in line. Right. And that puts everyone in a really a weird position, you know, cause, um, rather that's called, that's called often dysfunctional triangulation. So it's, it's much better to go right to the person and just, you know, you, the part of this whole thing that is hard for people is that, um, when you marry someone, you marry their family too. You just have to accept that, mm-hmm. you know, especially some families, you know, and this notion that you can sort of, um, 
uh, you know, carve out one part of a family and that's your person and everyone else is like irrelevant to you. You don't, you don't want a relationship with them. You don't want to deal with them. You don't want to do the work. Um, for some families, that's just not going to work and it's unfair and you're wrong headed and you should have thought about that before you got married to that person. So the um, part of this is like, you have to go on a campaign of like actually developing a relationship with those parents so that it can withstand occasional um, conflicts, you know, bonding, goodwill. And then, you know, when you're like, you know what, when you criticize me about the way that I clean my kitchen, it kind of bothers me. And I, you know, it hurts my feelings. I, I want you to come over and, you know, but I don't know, I just, just, just kind of, could you not do that, please? Yeah. You know, um, but if you don't feel comfortable doing that, it might be because you've never developed a relationship with that person. Anyway, any thoughts about that, Bob? My specific training was to do the other thing. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, counselors and their individualistic um, it was a, theories. It was when I was in Gottman training. Oh, really? No kidding. That, that's actually something I heard John Gottman say. What? To do the thing about get the person who's related to the parents to, to intervene. Oh. And he tells a story about how he did that and its impact on the marriage you know, drawing the boundary or whatever. So quite frankly, I really appreciate what you're saying here about cultural bias because, you know, what am I, I'm just a white suburbanite from outside Philadelphia. <laughs> I don't know much else. And um, uh, it's good to be able to think about things more broadly. I didn't grow up with a much extended family. So of course, all that made sense to me. Right. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can no, absolutely have that preference. And, but, and but it's a question of preference versus bias. And, pre and preference versus uh, claiming scientific proof that yeah. one thing is unhealthy. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah so yeah. this is actually, this is very good for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, number three is technoference. This is the, th the, we're still on the three high risk relationship complaints you shouldn't ignore. What was the second one? Uh, clashes with in-laws. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and their advice is draw boundaries. Right, right. Uh, and honestly, I heard that too. Um, you know, family yeah. therapy emerges out of a northern, northwestern European culture yeah. as well. And so um, boundaries were very important um, to some people. Anyway, number three is technoference. Create device-free times and zones. Um, because if someone's complaining about your device getting in between you and them, then you should really pay attention to that. What do you think about that, Bob? You know, uh, the other day uh, we were in couples therapy and our couples therapist said something really interesting. She said that one of the things that she and her husband do is they decide intentionally if it's going to be together time or alone time. And they might be doing alone time in the same room, but they're sort of like, um, you know, it's okay that I'm reading my book or whatever. But that when it's together time, it's actually intentional and that whatever they're doing is something intentional. And I think that's probably more important than whether or not somebody's on their device. Interesting. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, how does it feel? Do you feel connected? Um, yeah. How do you feel about asking someone to put down their phone or something? Right. Um, I mean, I think it's also... Uh, there's a lot of variability on this too. I think for, for some people, um, I, I feel like for my life, I know how to, because I'm on my phone occasionally, but I, f I feel like I know how to manage that so that I'm not being rude to someone else. You know, right. like there are times when I'm at dinner with people and, s s you know, someone brings up a question about something or even better yet, I'll take a picture of my steak and, and <laughs> post it um, on Yelp and on Facebook and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, it takes some time to kind of take the picture and, and it's, you know, I, I'm in a social situation yeah. and, and I'm in a sense kind of breaking from everybody. Right. Um, so I, I think that it's not a matter of never being on your phone. If, if that's what you need to do. And of course that's what you want to do then by all means. But I find that, um, in real life, it's like what you're saying. It's like, what's the overall vibe right. that's happening here, you know? And uh, let's tend to that. And if, if phones have something to do with that, then, you know, for sure, right. think about that. Um, but the other thing that I find is that, um, aside from people who have genuine addictions, so to speak, behavioral addictions to their phone, which mm. I think is kind of rare, mm. um, 
aside from those people, I find that um, for the most part, people know how to handle it, you know? And if they're not handling it, it's not often in my mind, the phone's fault or, or their relationship with the phone, which often gets blamed because it looks weird, you know, like yeah. you'll see two, you'll see a couple at dinner and they'll both be on their, they'll both be looking at their phone. It, right. just, it looks weird. You know? Yeah. It right. looks, looks like this dystopian future. Right. <laughs> and, and so you blame the phone. You're like, Oh, there's gotta get rid of the phones. But in all likelihood, that couple has a hard time relating in general, Yeah, you know? And so it's not the phone's fault. In fact, the phone might be helping to some extent because at least they're at dinner together. Dinner you know? together. Um, uh, so what really is the problem is maybe their ongoing resentment or their ability to talk or, um, I don't know, just tension that's happening in the relationship or right. something, you know? that that's, that's the problem. And once you kind of work on that, then the phone will just go away because people, people naturally want to relate to other human beings, you yeah. know? Yeah, right. Uh, Do you remember when cell phones came about and you know, like a, if I had a client that had one, because back, back in the day, I didn't have a cell phone yeah. and it would ring. And I think there was this time when we were thinking, oh, if the phone rings during the session that that's bad manners, you know, or something like, like your phone should be silenced or whatever. Uh -huh. And now I got to tell you, everybody's got a cell phone yeah. and they always ring in the middle of a session and I don't even pay attention to it. I just sort of ignore it because I figure, yeah, that's what happens. You know, and I often I'll say, do, do you need to get it? Because, you know, maybe that's their kid or something. Yeah. And most of the time, you know, they don't need to get it. And it's ringing and there's this sort of self-conscious moment. And I said, well, I guess part of our experience is going to be the sound of your phone ringing. <laughs> and it's fine. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, w why be embarrassed about that? That's like. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I agree with and I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it is, it is interesting that when I do have, because clients, you know, they all have a phone. Yeah. And there, or even an Apple watch or something that makes right. noises. And I find, well, I think two things. One is, is that the sounds that people's phones make today are much less aggravating than because <laughs> back in the day it was like, oh, they're terrible. It was like one sound. And now people, you know, it's like, dee -dee, dee -dee, yeah. you know, and so there's that, like I have, I have clients who have their phone going off and, and they react to it much bigger than I do. They're, oh my God, I got to silence my right. phone, you know? Yeah, right. And uh, because, you know, for them, they don't, they, it's their time and right. they don't want it to be interrupted by a bunch of dings and stuff. And yeah. So, so for me, yeah, it doesn't really bother me, but I'll tell you in the last three or four years, um, uh, cell phones got to a place in our culture where it started actually getting, it's getting on my nerves with my students. So up until about three or four years ago, oh, you're kidding! Phones were never, even though cell phones have been around a lot longer. Wow, they've they never bothered me um, for my students because I mean, occasionally like someone's phone would ring or ding or something, and we'd all kind of look and and they'd be mortified and they'd silence their phone or something. Right. Um, but in like starting about three or four years ago, uh, younger and maybe even older students would be their phone is like right in front of them on their desk. Yeah. And they would, you know, something visual, even if it's silence, you know, visually they'll yeah. get a text and I can see them looking at their phone, reading the text. Right. And, and even maybe even responding. Right. I had this one student who I could, she would, she was sitting right, you know, at Antioch, our classes, this, this class had five students in it. Right. You know? <laughs> the max is six, or maybe there were six people anyway. So, it's not a thousand person class where you're just going to blend into the crowd. She's sitting right next to me and she has her phone down by her knee. Yeah, and right. She, and she, I can see she's reading the phone and texting someone. And I'm like, I'm like, do you not? Uh, it's just, so yeah. with, with a, a few select students, um, it, w it got so aggravating to me over time and kind of disruptive to the class because other students yeah. know what's happening. You know, right. like we're all, the six of us or seven of us are talking intensely about someone and suddenly someone is like staring at their knee for five minutes. Right. You know, it doesn't, it's like some, at the very least that's weird. And two, it's like, Oh, that person isn't paying attention. And yeah. And so they're not going to know what we're talking about when they come back to us. Um, and so what I started having to do uh, is um, I started telling all my students, if I see your phone, I'm taking it. <laughs> Fifth grade. Yeah. And, and what I'd also say was if you have an emergency, like your kid is sick or some, or, you know, something that you need to monitor your phone, just let me know. 
Yeah. Like, tell me, tell me, and I'll I'll be totally fine with it. Cause sure. It, I don't, you know, if it's something legit that you have to monitor your phone for, because, you yeah. know, a lot of our students have kids and right. blah, blah, blah. And so it's like, by all means, you know, but you have to verbally tell me, inform me as to why you have your cell phone out. But if I see it in any other circumstance, I'm taking it away. And have you most, done it? No, I've never had to, oh, but good. I've threatened, you know, I've been like, uh, I see your phone and, and now I have no problem. I'll be like, put your phone away. Yeah. Like, and I, it feels so stupid. Do you know? Now the vast majority of students do not have a problem with this. Yeah, of course not. Cause they're mature. <laughs> you remember our first day of grad school? Well, yeah. <laughs> was that the first day? That was the first day. He was listening to the M's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On, on a trend. We talked about this in another episode, right? One of our students, Again, six, seven people in the class yeah, are right. sitting in a circle and he's yep. listening to a baseball game in on headphones yeah. while, while we're talking about deep topics of yeah. empathy and like personal growth and right. stuff. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, uh, yeah. He had a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, so what I, not only is it annoying to me to witness that kind of stuff and i and i come at it pretty strong right um but i absolutely consider it a competency of your skills as a clinician because if you can't for just a small amount of time separate uh from your phone like you're not going to be a good therapist yeah you know, you, you've got to you've got to start learning how to have some self-control around that or just do teletherapy <laughs> i guess right yeah maybe um yeah, yeah, I agree. And I've never heard anyone complain about that. Like, nah. no, no one's ever been like, Kirk is too hard about cell phones because they know they have no leg to stand on. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, <laughs> he wanted me to put it away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that chick. <laughs> but I do find it interesting that I never had to deal with that until like three or four years ago. That's amazing. And now it happens. Prob- there's probably one student in every class that has a problem that I can tell they, yeah. they need to be told. Amazing. You know? You know? Yeah. And so it's like in 20 years, is every student going to, you know, have that problem? I don't know. How's your retirement plan coming? (laughs) Uh, Article here on Trend in Tech. Five things you didn't know about about the human psychology. Number one, we don't actually multitask. It's practically impossible. What do you think about that, Bob? Uh, yeah, uh, that person has a point though. You know, when you think about it, every single thing that's happening is multitask while you're sitting here, you're swallowing, you're blinking, your heart is beating, your digestive system is digesting. It's all multitasking. Right. If you think about it that way. But if he's saying, you know, like I answered the email while I petted the dog and yeah, I get it. He's... Or you're reading a text while you're in a class. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like you right yeah but th- i think i think the thing about multitasking is you're talking about splitting attention right you know and is that the is that the is that a choice or is it sort of a habit or right i think know? what is worth talking about which is basically what you're saying is that there there became this time maybe in the 90s during like dot com times and like high powered corporation yeah. times when there was this value placed on people who could multitask, right? right? Who could, who were high performing people who could handle a lot of chaos. Which is a better way to say what it really means. Right. Yeah. Rather than this simplistic notion that like, I can do several things at the same time. Right. And, uh, and people would say that, like, I'm good with multi, I think, I think if I remember right, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, there was, there was like, you would put on your resume that you're yeah. good with multitasking. Right. I think that was a thing. And then, so this is sort of like saying, no, like if, if you're, if you're equating this with your ability to split your attention, like research has shown that actually reduces your performance in every area and you right. actually spend more time on everything because um, your brain isn't pop- capable of doing such things. But uh, number two, our brain rewrites monotonous speech of boring people. Have what? you heard this? This, what is, this is an interesting one. It does what? Um, our brain rewrites monotonous speech of boring people. So basically, it uh, they found that what we do, and I, I don't know, it's a, it's a functional MRI, so God knows of the validity of this. But oh, okay. That when we when someone talks in a very boring, monotonous way, we actually um, create uh, we. It's sort of like when 
we see the uh, w- gold dress or the blue dress. Have you see that? Whole oh yeah, thing? yeah, I've seen that one. Um, you know, our reality is constructed in our head. We have a stimulus to our to our brain, and our brain creates reality. It's so um, so um, when someone's talking to us in a very monotonous way, our brain might start to actually create less monotony in the voice to make it more interesting to us. That's interesting. So it's like, hello. My name is Kirk. I am speaking in a very monotonous voice. And and maybe over time, eventually your brain starts like creating more lilt in the voice or that. I don't know. Look, everybody saw Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Ben Stein, man, giving that talk about. Bueller. What the, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, he doesn't get any more monotonous. I don't know. I, I have, I've never heard of that before. It seems uh, a very esoteric thing to study. And to report on, because it's like five things you didn't know about psychology and like this random detail. Yeah. Um, do you know Ben Stein? Wasn't he involved in like some pseudoscience of some kind, like anti-vax and stuff? Was he? Yeah, I think no, so. No, I don't know that. Or I know he wrote speeches for Nixon. Yeah, like uh, evolution versus creationism or something. Really? I, I, I don't remember. Um, number three, people can become addicted to anything, good and bad. Oh, oh, well. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. You know, like addicted has um, become a pop culture word. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. What What don't you know? I don't know if um, if we aren't overusing that term. Yeah. What's the harm in over overusing it? Um, you end up applying a, a model of treatment to things where the model might not fit, and it might actually water down where at least as I understand the term addiction, where that actually has validity. Right, like addicted to heroin. For yeah, example. like that's fucking addicted. Right. Yeah, I find that um, as with the word racism in our culture and as with the word taking offense, like, you know, I'm offended, that phrase, I, I find that oh, the, that's word, interesting. the word addiction has lost its meaning, yeah. you know, um, and uh, has become too broadly applied in some areas and in other areas it's an extremely specific idea like to some people addiction means that you were biologically dis- you have a biological disposition you have a biological thing about you that makes you um, use substances or a substance um, all the time another use that i hear people using it is that you're um, quote unquote physically addicted, that you, if you stop doing it, you'll have withdrawal symptoms yeah. like heroin, caffeine, booze, uh, booze. You'll have this, um, you know, you're addicted because yeah. if you stop, you'll have withdrawal symptoms. Right. Um, so those are very specific ways of using the term. And then, th- and then there's this huge, uh, broad use of the term, which is like, problematic habit yeah right right. like um being addicted to your phone for example right it's a problem it's a problem the habit that you have developed with your phone is a problem because it's creating distance between you and your friends and um you're uh putting yourself at risk of getting in car accidents because you're looking at your phone and you're having trouble falling asleep at night because you're reading things on your phone like um you're addicted to your phone you know um, and so those are all very different concepts. Oh yeah. Right. And so when I hear people use the word addiction, I have no idea unless I can tell what they yeah. mean right. by the concept in the same way that I have no idea what people mean when they say I'm taking offense or that's racist. You know, there are people that will say things like, um, you know, Donald Trump, my cat is meowing. Um, Donald Trump is racist. You know, they'll say something like that. And it's like, well, what do you mean? Like what, what exactly are you saying? Are you saying like he has racist policies that are harming particular races based on bias and hatred towards particular kinds of race and preference for others? Uh, are you talking about the fact that we're all racist because we all have bias about race? Like, Ooh. like what, what are you talking about exactly? Right. You know, are you talking about, you just don't like him, you know? Um, you know, uh, or, or people will say like, is have you seen Moana the the cartoon? No, Moana it's, it's Hawaiian. The Hawaiian, yeah. Um, they'll say uh, Moana is racist. They'll say something like that. Oh, and it's like 
I have no idea what, what they mean by that, you know, but that's all that they'll say. The, oh, that's a racist saying, movie. The film is racist? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, uh, we can get into it. But, yeah, right. We could. Uh, I mean, Moana. So the problem with Moana that some people have uh, in general, I mean, I'm a Asian Pacific Islander and I love the movie. Um, I, I consider it to be one of the better ones in that genre. Um, my cat really wants in the office right now. Um, and you're not letting him in. Does that mean you're a catist? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a catist. <laughs> um, she, you know, she's, she's not superior enough to get into the, <laughs> to the upper echelon of this office right now. Humans only. Um, the uh, problems that some people pointed to was that they took these, um, th- these myths or, or gods or s- legends or stories or culture and altered it to this sort of a, a more mainstream Americanized version, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and also there's, there's this scene where there's these bad guys. They're sort of like bad spirits in a sense, but they are, um, they're, they're coconuts or they're wearing coconuts. They look like, it looks like they're coconuts with legs and arms and they have these super stereotypical um, kind of like oogly boogly uh, island native uh, cannibal people. You know what I mean? Oh like, yeah. Like I know there, what you there's mean. a certain way that that will be portrayed, you know, lots yeah. of drums yeah. and um, you know, bones in the, in the yeah. nose stereotyped and spears and, and very um, aggressive and, and violent. And, right. And, uh, and so, although the first time I saw that movie, I was, it didn't bother me, but when I, but later when I heard about that, I thought, oh yeah, that is, it is, you know, it's like, cause they could have made the, uh, the villains or the bad guys, anything they could have, they could have made them white people for crying out loud. <laughs> like that would have been historically accurate. Um, <laughs> or they could have just been less in the vein of stereotypical yeah. cannibal, oogly boogly. Yeah. Island native people. Um, I don't know how you would do that exactly, but uh, anyway. Um, so, addiction. Number four, your brain actually wants fewer choices than you might think. Have you heard about this effect that was studied? Oh, yeah. It's like we are overwhelmed by choices, kind of the, the thing. Right. It sounded true to me. What do you think? Well, the data shows. Yeah. Like, um, the, the guy who did it, I forget his name, is it... Um, uh, Iyengar, is that who it was? But the talk that he gave, what he, what he said was, you know, back in the day when we were younger, there was like two pairs of jeans that you had an option of, you know, you had, um, 501 Levi jeans and maybe like tough skins or something. Oh yeah. I had those. Yeah. Um, God, did I want Levi's when I was a kid? (laughs) Everyone in my school had Levi's. I, I remember one day, I don't know if I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I was in the sixth grade, I think. And this would have been 81, 82. And I did a, um, uh, a mental census of everyone's uh, uh, clothing and counted everyone who wasn't wearing 501 Levi jeans. It wasn't just Levi's. It was... 501. In fact, it wasn't until probably, I don't know, a lot later that I even knew that 501 was like just one of the things that Levi's made. Anyway, um, so I did this count and, you know, I, th- I think my class had, I'm going to estimate like 200 kids in it. And there were four kids who did not have 501 Levi jeans and I was one of them. Wow. And the three other ones were nerds, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> you and three nerds. Yeah. I think Chris Glover is actually another one of them. Um, and you know, we were, we were wearing, you know, tough skins or, um, there was this other one called Seattle blues. Do you, you no, wouldn't have remember Seattle here. blues. Yeah. yeah. Um, Seattle blues was this commercial. Um, and, uh, I, I God, I just, I went home. I was like, mom, this is getting ridiculous. But she was, she was, my mom was always like, Levi's make your butt look funny. Cause you know, <laughs> Le- Levi's are, um, you know, they're, co- they're more baggy, I guess. It's a more baggy look than the jeans of other mm-hmm. types, I, yeah. I guess. At least the 501s. Right. And so, um, 
Have I ever told you the story before? No. So uh, I beg and beg and beg. And finally, you know, I get my mom to buy me some Levi jeans. And so we go to the store and I get, I get my Levi jeans. And back then, I, I, I'm guessing you remember, they weren't pre-shrunk. So, so okay. you had to, you had to wash them like five times before they were the right size. So when you went to the store and tried them on, you had no idea if it, they were going to fit. You just had to take, and, and the salespeople always had like a, some kind of metric, you know, it's like, well, you want like this amount of room in the waist because that's how, and it would shrink a lot. It yeah. would shrink by like a number of inches. You yeah. know, it was like if it, if you wore a, you know, a 38, you needed to buy a 40 right. or even a 42 because it would shrink so much, both lengthwise and, and, and in the waistline. But I was so happy to have my Levi's that I didn't want to wait for my mom. Because, you know, she wasn't going to wash them special. She was going to put them in the regular laundry yeah. cycle like once a week. Right. And so I was going to have to wait like five weeks or something. And I think by then it would have been the summer and I'll be damned if I'm not going to wear those Levi's. And I, but I didn't have a belt. And so <laughs> all day long, I'm, I'm like constantly holding these jeans on. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm so happy that I have Levi jeans. But I must have looked ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, who's that boy, you know, in that hefty bag of a denim, you know? Um, it did make your butt look funny. <laughs> it was true. It was true. Yeah. And, you know, that's how the um, trend of sagging your jeans started was everyone was looking at me. <laughs> um, yeah. So the idea goes that back in the day, we had very few choices for jeans and we were we had a certain happiness level after choosing our jeans. You know, we we would look at the two different options, and we we'd look at our we'd look at our butt in the mirror, and we'd choose which one uh, we liked, and we walked home, and and we were like we felt a certain rate of happiness, and and buyer's remorse wasn't as great. Um, and and as other choices started to come out, Seattle Blues, uh, Guess Jeans, I remember came out, Jordash, uh, then you got like. Um, seven isn't seven. Nordstrom started to make some, um, you know, all the different kinds of jeans. You know, Tufkins were still there, right? And Levi starts to have seven hundred one and right five eleven and or whatever, right? And the thinking is, well, then I'll what you know now I'll be for sure able to find the perfect pair of jeans because about in the past I just had two options. Now I have like like 50 options, right. this is going to be awesome. Like I'm going to be able to find a much better fitting pair of jeans. And so therefore I'm going to walk away from that shopping experience much happier than I was in the past. But what they found was that people actually walked away from those 50 options. And, you know, they took time to figure out which, but they might not be able to try all 50 is the problem. So right. they, and they don't have time. And also it's hard to measure you know when you're going levi's versus tough skins it's easy to measure which one's better you know but when you're you know all the different options what they found was that people were very dissatisfied in general comparatively to the people who had fewer options and the idea is is that and you know i think you know this bob but to the listeners um is that more options make you feel like you might have not made the best choice yeah and Therefore, you're always wondering if you made a mistake. Whereas when you had two choices between Levi's and Toughskins, there's an obvious choice, and you don't feel you're, you don't you buy the Levi's, you walk away, you're like, I know I made the right choice. There's right. really no question. But when you have fifty, 50 options or right. more, yeah. you're just and and some options might not even be available to you at that store, right? You have to go to like ten different stores, and right. some are online and blah blah blah, and you're always just like that. I, it I'm you know so you buy but. You, you, know, you spend however much time, you buy a pair of jeans, you bring them home, you're fairly certain you did not get the optimal pair of jeans because what's the chance that of the 5% of options that you managed to get before you, the best optimal pair of jeans was in that 5%. You don't think you won the lottery. Right. And I find this to be one of the um, interesting things about our society that um, every once in a while I just marvel at. Like... Um, you know, when we were kids at the grocery store, there was like two kinds of potato chips. You had just regular Lay's. Um, I think Pringles has been around for a long time. Yeah. But you had just one kind of Pringles. 
um, Doritos, actually, the nacho flavor came out, I remember, later in my life. It was like around maybe 82 or 80 or something when they came out with the nacho cheese Doritos. Like before, it was just like Doritos was just like a tortilla chip, just like a plain tortilla chip. Right. Um, I guess Cheetos has been around for a long time. But anyway, the choices were, you know, there's probably a handful of choices at the grocery store. Now, you go to the grocery store, and it is an entire aisle of, um, I'm going to take a rough guess. I mean, how, how many different just, you know, even within a brand, different options you have in the in the snack aisle. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Corn chip, just just corn chips. Yeah. Just cor- there's just tortilla 500 chips. different kinds of, you know. Yeah. And you can't even find the ones you want anyways, which is Harvest Cheddar Sun Chips because they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and I marvel at that because yeah. I look at those aisles and I'm thinking, my God, you know. The other thing that I also kind of marvel at at grocery stores today, every once in a while, I'll just do a mental, um, I'll, I'll scan the, the aisles and I'll think, um, is anything in this aisle good for you? <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you leave in disgust. Like, or, or another question, is anything in this aisle really necessary? Um, you know? Yeah. And what I find is like, there's maybe 3% of the grocery store is good for you and necessary. Right. You know, we're talking like the produce section. Right. Um, because again, the you have an entire aisle just for just for potato chips or other, you know, yeah, variations. Snacks. Yeah. Yeah. You have an entire aisle of sport drinks and soda drinks. Oh, two at my grocery store. You have an another you have entire wings of alcohol, which thank God. Yeah. But you know But that is necessary. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, it's 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 crazy. You know, entire aisles of like different kinds of tea and coffee. Yeah, and it's it's mind boggling. You know, it's just so much so much in the store. Entire aisles of frozen pizza. You know, um, so uh, I don't know how we get on that one, but anyway. So have you ever run into that where you find there's too many choices and it's overwhelming all the time? Like with what? Oh, let's see. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, well, last week, Colleen wanted a cover for her iPad, and we looked at probably 40 different different kinds of iPad. Like in person or online? No, online at Amazon. And um, funny, the one the one I was really hoping she would get was, was like made for kids because it looked like it had a steering wheel around it so you could hold it, you know? I was really hoping she'd get that one, but she didn't. She got the other one. <laughs> but but honest to God, we I looked at, I mean, I sort of did this. I went through it for her because she was busy with something else. And I looked at like 40 different versions of an iPad cover, of a fucking iPad cover. Like just, what do you mean cover? Like uh, one that it covers the front. Oh, they have those too. Oh. Yeah, no. Just, she was having trouble holding it because it's it was just sliding out of her hand. So she needed a way to hold oh, like it. like a case. A case. Yeah, that's what they call them. Cases. Like a, like a leather case yeah, or, 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 plastic, or plastic or rubber or neoprene or, or denim yeah, denim they have denim <laughs> i i don't i can't substantiate that that's i don't know if that's true yeah so many choices when yeah when all you need is just you know just give me the standard grippy case right that's all i need right yeah. and and i could find the standard grippy case but i'd be looking at the 13 other different choices because maybe i want that one. Oh. oh yeah and everything everything i shop for it's like that yeah i can think of it i mean peanut I, butter I, what i i've gone through this with peanut butter tell me well uh when i was young it was, I was, it was when we were in school together way back when I was a little depressed at the time. I stood in front of the peanut butter aisle for 10 fucking minutes trying to decide which jar to get. Should I get the big one or the little one? How should I get the one that's recyclable? Or should I get the one that's got no sugar added? Or And as soon as I well, realized... the question I'm, is, is crunchy or creamy? Creamy, of course. Oh, don't, no. Don't be, oh, no. Crunchy gets stuck in my teeth. Oh, no. I, I can't eat it. It's, oh, it's not good. Like, don't you have teeth? Like, chew. Chew more. <laughs> don't, don't put that pressure on me. <laughs> I can't guarantee I'm going to chew. After I figured out I'd been there for 10 minutes, it still took two damn minutes to actually pick. Yeah. Gah. Yeah, there's a lot of options when it comes to, to peanut butter, too. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, or jam, you know? Oh, like, yeah, I, jam. I remember when I was a kid, there was, like, there was very few options. You had, like, 
grape and, grape. and cherry, I guess, or whatever the red one is. Raspberry, maybe raspberry, strawberry. Yeah, ra- yeah raspberry, yeah. strawberry, smuck, smuckers. Yeah. And, and now it's just like you got artisan this and that. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. You know. It's almond butter and cashew butter and... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I get, you know, thank God. Uh, like one of the things that I love about grocery stores in Seattle anyway is they all have um, seaweed snacks. Oh, really? You know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean seaweed snacks, which would... Uh, never have been in our grocery store even just 10 years ago. No, no. Um, I love my seaweed snacks. No shit. Yeah. I probably, I probably, so a seaweed snack is uh, like a standard size. It's, it's this little plastic bowl and it has probably, I don't know, like 25 little small sheets of seaweed. And um, and it's the good kind of seaweed. Like sushi seaweed is kind of thick. Mm-hmm. This this is snack seaweed, which is more thin so it doesn't um, like sushi seaweed actually can be quite tough at yeah. times because uh, it needs to with it needs to hold everything in you know right and it also gets fairly soggy with the moisture from the rice right. and so it it tends to soften because of that anyway uh, are these are these like chips seaweed they're, snacks no they're they're I mean you can treat them like chips but they're sheets they're small sheets of thin um, you know slightly salted slightly flavored seaweed and uh, dried seaweed, again similar to um, sushi seaweed, and it is you eat it. I guess you eat it like um, like a kale chip kind of, but they're not crunchy. I mean, they're kind of crunchy, but <laughs> everybody doesn't know what a fucking kale chip is. What the hell is that? <laughs> uh, well, it's funny, you know, because I don't think there's really anything like it that you could. Oh, that, that well, are they could, are they like? firm are they stiff are they soft yeah, if you hold are they it, chewy yeah if you hold it it's it's firm but firm. it's but and if you bend it um it might actually like crack but okay but it's so it's in between okay like flexible and crunchy yeah um and you know it's it you eat it like a potato chip ish thing oh, okay but it's very low calorie yeah. and it actually has like good things for you you know i'm guessing it has you know vegetable goodness in it or something right. you know i eat probably eight uh little things of that a day <laughs> eight bowls a day yeah so so wow. you know yeah eight. it's like 200 chips yeah yeah huh. yeah i've I, been knowing you for years you've never offered me even one <laughs> <laughs> well because re- it wasn't until recently that they even had this um available really yeah um in the past i would actually get big sheets of seaweed right. that you make for sushi and I would um, tear it up into pieces and eat it that way. But yeah. that's a lot less convenient than this way. Good to so know. some some increase in choice I really appreciate. Uh, the last one, number five here is, according to scientists, capital S, ah. so I don't know why you would capitalize scientists. According to scientists... It takes 66 days for us to form a habit. Oh, I heard it's 21. Oh, well, then this is wrong. I, maybe it is. I don't know. Um, when is the last time you tried to develop a new habit? You've been dieting, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 152 days so far. Uh, you look, I don't you know. You look great, by the way. <laughs> you do. You look, you, you look, I mean, I was joking, but you actually do look thinner. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've lost 18 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think that's probably the only habit I'm working on, but I don't even consider that a habit change because I'm sort of just stuck doing this until we can kind of level out and I'll probably get fat again. But it's totally a habit, right? Because you, you just get into a habit of a certain diet thing. That's then, true. That's you know, true. And a certain way of reacting to people inviting you out and that kind of stuff. That, yeah. that, that's all true. Yes. Yeah. Someone actually wrote in to us and crit- criticized us. Um, she was sure to say she loves the podcast, but she criticized us for you and me talking about when we were talking about weight loss uh-huh. and one of the, we talked about a lot of things in that podcast and I don't remember when we were just kind of talking off the cuff. Yeah. And we talked if, if correct me if I'm wrong about um, the fact that when you, if, in order to lose weight, you might have to endure some hunger, some oh. moments where you're hungry. Yeah. I remember that. And what she was saying, I think she might even be a nutritionist. I'm not sure is that, that is a false notion. What do you oh. think about that? Well, she would know better than me. Right. That's what I said. I was like, I don't know. You're the nutritionist. But at the same time, I think that 
um, for me anyway, that's all I can think of is for me. And I think for many people I know um, that if you're really going to lose weight, you have to be, you have to be, um, you have to change the amount of calories that you eat. Now you can certainly eat things that are more filling that have less calories. That's absolutely a strategy that everyone should, you know, consider. Right. But at the same time, there might be times when you're hungry, when it's not a good idea to, um, try to alleviate that hunger. Because if, if that's your, if that's your habit of like, when I feel hungry, yeah. I will eliminate it. You might have a harder time reducing your total caloric intake, you know? Yeah. I think when we talked about it that day, we talked about, um, um, the need to be able to endure pain. And I think, I don't know if I'm right about this, but I think we were using that as a way to kind of describe that we have a culture that, you know, really tries to alleviate pain at all costs. Maybe a, maybe a thing you could say, um, is that if you're going to change your eating habits, you're going to have to deal with some disappointment. Right. Yeah. You're going to, there's going to be some bummer to it, you know? Totally. Yeah. Uh, and the avoidance of bummer is probably why right. you've gained weight, you know? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I do know. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, uh, even the bummer of just like, um, I want, uh, I just feel like stuffing that in my face. You right. know, I just did. I just want to do that. Um, but having said that, yeah, I'm sure there are cases and plans that reduce the, yeah. the incidence of feeling hungry. But I have to tell you from, from myself, um, it, when I, manage to lose weight like there are you know there are moments where i i, I don't know if it's hunger or a craving or yeah, whatever but right. I, I i have a urge, urge to eat yeah or to eat more and i have to say no yeah and that's what we were saying is just like yeah um that's a part of the uh the you know if you really want to lose weight or at least one of the ways yeah you have to accept that that's just that's just how things are going to be and how do you tolerate that? And how do you view it? You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> In my family, Japanese people were very into food. And so we have this joke about my aunt, um, you know, Auntie Carol. Sure. I might've even talked about this before, but she, um, that we have this joke. I, I don't know how accurate it is, but we talk about it like it's a true story. And she does too, is that she had these, this pain in her stomach and she went to the doctor and the doctor ran, ran all these different tests. And then, uh, asked her, uh, well, when was the last time you ate? And she's like, oh, well, it was, I don't know, maybe since yesterday. And he's like, I think what you're describing is hunger. And we all get a kick out of that because yeah. in our family, uh, we never are hungry because we're constantly eating all right. the time. Oh, I get it. Yeah. And so it's this big laughable Honda thing nice. to, um, that Auntie Carol went to the doctor because she felt hungry. <laughs> Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me, Bob. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here. And thanks for joining us out there in podcast land. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Mm -hmm.